Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Greetings, and welcome to another episode of The Glories of Mary. My name is Jason Brunel, and I'll be your host from 8 o'clock till 9 o'clock, discussing the truths of Our Lady as the uh, mother of Christ and uh, the truth regarding her assumption, her body, her bodily assumption into the glory of heaven. So before we begin this show, let us recollect ourselves and place ourselves in the presence of God, asking him for the graces we will need to be as subjectively open as possible to receive all the graces that he wishes to that, that he wishes to fill us with. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Lord, fill us with your presence. Come into our hearts, come into our souls. Having just received you in Holy Communion, I ask that you, Lord Jesus, might enthrone yourself in my soul and purge our hearts of any sinful and or inordinate desires or attachments. May the greatest, all-consuming, ever-increasing desire of our hearts and souls be a radical, transforming union of our heart with your sacred and Eucharistic heart of our intellect and will, with your most holy and divine intellect and your most holy will. May we seek to carry out your will in every least circumstance of our lives, as this is made known to us through the teaching of your holy church founded on St. Peter. May we look to the commandments to know how we ought to live. May we look to the virtues, to know which virtues we might cultivate. And through all of the communions we have ever received with you, and particularly the most recent communion that we, that we have received through the tremendous gift of yourself to us, you having died for us, literally having laid down your life for us, to show us that you could not love us any more than you do and that your love for us is as all-consuming as is your love for your Heavenly Father and your Heavenly Father's love for you and that you desire us to be one with each other just as you and the Father are one and to be one with you so that we might all be one May we be united through the bond of charity, which is the Holy Spirit. Thus, send forth your Spirit into our hearts and souls. May the bond that is the Holy Spirit, who is the very divine love of the Trinity, bind us and unite us ever more perfectly to you and to your mystical body. You are the head, Lord Jesus, and we are your members we comprise your mystical body. And we want to be ever more perfectly united to you. And we want you to reign in our hearts and souls so that every person we come into contact with might see and experience only you, Lord Jesus. May we love you in the manner that you love the most by shining your light on every single person we encounter this day and every day of our lives. May everybody who sees us experience and see you and you alone. May you shine through us onto every person we encounter this day and every day of our lives. The light will be all from you. None of it will be ours. It will be you shining on those 
who see us for the greater glory of God the Father. And for those of us who have not had the opportunity to receive our Lord sacramentally, let us, let us make a spiritual communion. Lord Jesus, we turn toward the holy tabernacle where you live hidden for love of us. We love you, our Lord and our God. But we cannot now receive you sacramentally. We beg you to come nevertheless and visit us with your grace. Come spiritually into our hearts and souls. Fill us with your presence, your divine life, and your divine love. We embrace you as one who has already come. Set our hearts aflame with the divine love of your supernatural charity. May the burning love of the furnace of your sacred and Eucharistic heart set us ablaze with the very divine love that consumes your heart and that drove you to the cross to lay down your life for us. For greater love no man has than this, than to lay down one's life for one's friends. And you have laid down your life for us because you call us friends. In assuming a human nature, you have elevated all of human nature. You have elevated everything that we as human beings do. You have elevated human work and labor. You have elevated human suffering. You have taken something that was a, a consequence or an effect of, of sin and you have turned it into the very means by which we are saved and the means by which we can participate with you, Lord Jesus, in, in, in carrying out our priestly role and in exercising the priesthood that you have allowed us to participate in to offer the sufferings of our lives, the prayers, the works, and even the joys in union with your perfect offering of yourself, which is renewed each day throughout the world from the rising of the sun to its setting in every holy mass that ever has been, is being, or will be offered to the glory of God the Father in an unceasing act of adoration and glorification and gratitude and expiation, reparation and supplication, the prayer of the ages, the most holy sacrifice of the mass to glorify God the Father for all the intentions of your sacred heart, Lord Jesus, for all the intentions of the immaculate and sorrowful heart of your mother Mary, to whom we renew our total consecration in order to most perfectly belong to you, and for all souls until the end of time, for the salvation of all souls until the end of time. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I, I, I usually pray a, um, a beautiful prayer called the Anima Christi after making a spiritual communion. And so let's pray that prayer as well. Soul of Christ, sanctify my soul. Body of Christ, save me. Blood of Christ, Soul of Christ, sanctify my soul. Body of Christ, save me. Blood of Christ, inebriate me. Water from the side of Christ, wash me. Passion of Christ, strengthen me. O oh, good Jesus, hear me. Within your holy wounds, hide me. Permit me never to be separated from thee. From the malignant enemy, defend me. And at the hour of my death, bid me to come to thee, that I might glorify thee for all eternity with all the elect in heaven. Amen. Praise you, Jesus. Through, with, and in the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Amen. Our Lady, Seat of Wisdom, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> this week, we are going to be discussing, uh, picking up where we left off last week, which was uh, with the fourth um, significant dogma, the fourth major dogma uh, regarding Our Lady. And that is the assumption of Our Lady into heaven, the assumption, Our Lady's bodily assumption into heaven. Um, and I'm going to be using um, 
a book that I, have, that I have called Introduction to Mary, The Heart of Marian Doctrine and Devotion. This book is by Dr. Mark Miravalli, Professor of Theology and Mariology at Franciscan University of Steubenville. And um, on page 50 of his book, we have the, uh, he addresses the assumption of our Blessed Lady, and he states that the fourth central Marian doctrine is the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. The doctrine of Mary's assumption, like her immaculate conception, has the added certainty of an infallible papal statement. So like the immaculate conception, which is a doctrine and which was additionally raised to the level of a, uh, an ex cathedra dogmatically defined uh, uh, um, infallible statement, uh, in the case of the Immaculate Conception, it was Pius the Twelfth. I'm sorry, it was um, rather it was uh, the Immaculate Conception was uh, Pius the Ninth. Um, we have Pius the Twelfth in 1950 declaring the Assumption of Mary in the following statement, and this is how I concluded last week's uh, episode. Quote: The Immaculate Mother of God. The ever-Virgin Mary, having completed the course of her earthly life, was assumed body and soul into heavenly glory, end of quote. And that is taken from the document Munificentissimus Deus. Um, now, he goes on to say, what evidence is present in the sources of divine revelation, sacred scripture and sacred tradition, for the doctrine of Mary's glorious assumption? Pope Pius XII, in his papal document, declares the assumption a doctrine, quote-unquote, revealed by God, and refers to several sources. And so let's first address what the magisterium has to say. The doctrine of Mary's assumption received the unanimous consensus uh, from the magisterium of the church um, in 1946, Pope Pius XII petitioned the bishops of the world, asking them whether the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary could be defined and whether they favored such a definition. Out of the 1,232 bishops, 1,210 of those same bishops enthusiastically answered yes to both questions. Uh, and which, if you do the math, is over 98%. So such near unanim unanimity, <laughs> I can't pronounce that word, such near unanimity amongst the bishops of the church is almost unprecedented in the history of the church re regarding doctrinal pronouncements. This was clearly uh, an amazing instance of, of the bishops acting uh, of, of being truly being in, uh, of one mind and one heart with the Holy Father, and what a beautiful what a beautiful manifestation of how the magisterium really is supposed to work. That's that's really what we're supposed to see. Ideally, that is what we're supposed to see. Um, very sadly, and I think anyone who's listened to the program knows where I'm going with this. Um, we are seeing in our day some very, uh, very, very sad things happening in the church. Um, and um, not to go off on a, a crazy tangent or anything, but um, so many, uh, we are, this, this show is being, as it is devoted to the Blessed Virgin Mary, um, uh, we do often talk about Marian revelations, and so many of the predictions that Our Lady gave to us, has, or has given to us, over the past 100 or 200 years, uh, had to do with a, a major, uh, a major uh, crisis uh, that would indeed take place in the church, that a crisis that would rock the church, uh, in addition to uh, social chaos, cultural chaos, um, cat natural cataclysms, um, and um, she even went so far as to say in, in, in her message, the approved message of Our Lady of La Salette to the, the, to, the, to the youngsters who received the apparition of Our Lady of La Salette, um, who was crying, she was weeping over the, over the um, 
the state of the church in the at the end of the 19th uh, or the beginning I should say the end of the 20th century into the into the 21st century and um, and she was weeping specifically over uh, well message of lost light is a very long a very intense message but one of the things that really stands out uh, is when she states that we will see cardinal opposing cardinal, bishop opposing bishop, and an almost unprecedented level of, of, of disunity in the ranks of the hierarchy of the church. Basically the opposite of what we saw uh, when Pius XII sent out this petition to all the world's bishops, and you had over 98% unanimity. Um, which is just amazing. Um, today we have uh, just a, a real, probably one of the, the the single greatest crisis in the church. Um, but that it it is very very serious. However, on the other hand, I must I must point out the absolute truth that this period of human history has been entrusted to Our Lady, and she has promised us that her immaculate heart will triumph, and an era of peace will be granted to the world. Moreover, we have the, pro- we, now that's granted, that's, that's from a private revelation. Um, it, yes, it is approved by the church, uh, but it is still a private revelation, and if we want uh, to go a step further and look to the public revelation. We can look to the words of Christ who promises indefectibility. The, the, the church, in the, in the very words of our Lord Jesus Christ himself, who is the Son of God and the Son of Man, um, Jesus Christ, who founded his church on the rock of St. Peter, In so doing, when he was handing the keys of the kingdom to Peter, the keys that bind and and that loose um, in uh, Matthew 16, verses 13 through 20, we have the Petrine primacy text. Um, Our Lord asks, who do men say that I am? And his apostles respond, well, some say, Jeremiah, some say Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. And he said, well, who do you, who do you say that I am? And Peter eventually stepped forward as he did, uh, as it was, he, he was wont to do. He stepped forward and he said, you are the Christ. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Um, and Christ, uh, the, the Christ means the Christ means anointed one. You are the anointed one, the the long-awaited Messiah, the anointed one. Je- the name Jesus means God saves. Christ, Christos, the anointed one. You are Christ, the Son of the Living God. And Jesus says, "Blessed are you, Simon Bar Jonah, Simon son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven." And to you, or rather, yes, to you I entrust the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you buy, and you, actually, before he says that, he says, he, he calls him, first initially he calls him Simon because his name was Simon, but he changes his name to, to Peter. And the name Peter comes from Petrus, which means rock. So you are Petrus, you are Peter, you are the rock. And on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. To you I entrust the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you hold bound on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loosen on earth will be loosed in heaven. The power of binding and loosening. The, the power of the keys, the Petrine primacy, uh, the primacy of Peter, um, papal infallibility, 
when it comes to making these pronouncements, ex cathedra, ex cathedra being from the chair. Uh, that's what the word, the, the term ex cathedra means, from the chair. And when the, and the, the whole concept, it's very interesting because back in the early days of, uh, back in the, when, when universities began and they were founded by the Catholic Church, the, the entire university education system was founded by the Catholic Church, as was the hospital system, as was uh, public education, as were uh, so many, so many fundamental institutions uh, in Western civilization that have been adopted by the world, uh, by Eastern civilization, um, sprang from specifically Catholic uh, practices that became part and parcel of Western culture and Western civilization. Um, everything from our way of, from everything from our politics to our, the way we cared for the poorest of the poor, um, the Catholic Church has always had a preferential option for the poor. And that's always been something so integral to the mission on, uh, of, of going and making disciples of all nations and of being Christ to uh, every person we encounter. Um, the Church as an institution has always contributed so substantially to every society that it ever became a part of. Um, and, and these contributions are so significant that they're literally woven into the very fabric of Western civilization. And it is so incredibly sad and, 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 and deeply, deeply disturbing to see how secular society is, is, is pushing so hard against um, the Catholic Church and, and just Christianity in, in, in general, and, and Catholicism in particular, uh, with regard to Christianity having a voice in the public square, any religion uh, has a greater voice than Christianity and Catholicism in particular. Um, and, and, the reason, and the reason for that is simple. It's simply because Catholic Christianity teaches well, authentic Catholic Christianity, not the counterfeit Catholic Christianity that many are trying to pass off as Catholic Christianity these days, uh, even amongst the ranks of, of, of hierarchy. Um, I'm talking authentic Catholic Christian teaching, which can be found in the Catechism, uh, in the Catechism of the Council of Trent, um, the very, all of the councils, the Second Vatican Council, the First Vatican Council, uh, starting with the very first council of Jerusalem, uh, where St. Paul and St. Peter uh, got into a heated discussion uh, over whether or not individuals, in order to be received into the church, would have to first become Jewish uh, in order to become Christian. And uh, that was a very fundamental discussion, a uh, critical issue, that, that the, the very first major issue uh, that, the, that, that a church council ever had to wrestle with and, and determine, and they determined that no, uh, it was not necessary, uh, that, 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 was, that all of the laws of the old dispensation belonged to the old dispensation, and the, <clears throat> the, the new law of grace in Christ uh, and everything that that entails with the sacramental economy of grace, uh, it was not necessary to take up the, the many, many dietary regulations and what have you. But, but we, we see culture, you know, trying to eschew and trying to, um, trying to drown uh, Christianity and, and, and Catholicism and, and, and not giving credit where credit is due in terms of the countless contributions made by the Catholic Church to society in the form of higher education, in the form of hospitals, and uh, the, the, the treating, treating the, caring for the sick, caring for the elderly and the disabled, uh, caring for the homeless, um, 
Catholic Charities is a is a just a huge organization. Um, but anyway, we uh, let's get back to the assumption, uh, discussing the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So this we have this beautiful uh, this beautiful example of the hierarchy. Um, in almost perfect unison with the Holy Father, Pope Pius XII, who had sent out a, a petition to ask the bishops if it would be appropriate to declare ex cathedra uh, Mary's uh, role as, the, uh, as having been assumed body and soul into heaven. So Pope Pius XII uh, in the service of the bishop, and I'm reading again from um, Dr. Maravalli's book, Pope Pius XII, therefore, in, this, in the service of the bishops and of the common faithful, used the charism of infallibility to define and confirm this universally accepted doctrine. In fact, after the papal definition of the Immaculate Conception in 1854, the Vatican received millions of petitions from bishops, priests, religious, and faithful alike asking for the definition of the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So after they had defined the Immaculate Conception in 1854, the Vatican received millions of petitions from bishops, priests, religious, and faithful asking for this same type of ex cathedra declaration and definition of Mary's assumption. And you see, this is what we call, this, this, this is a, uh, this, this movement on the part of the laity, uh, on the part of the, the body of Christ, clearly, that, it, that was a manifestation, a true, authentic manifestation of the sense, that was what we call the sense of the faithful, the Holy, and, and that is nothing other than the Holy Spirit working in the very body of Christ, uniting the body of Christ as one mind and one heart. And you see this unanimity amongst the members of the mystical body. You see the Spirit speaking through all the members. I mean, I'm certainly not every single person necessarily, but an overwhelming majority. And you see uh, that, that concrete reality of, of, of unity in mind and unity of heart, and it's beautiful. Um, and that very same thing is, it has again happened uh, in history, and um, in fact, as it happens, the the author of the book that I'm using at this at this time to uh, to share the truths of the assumption, Dr. Mark Miravalli, has spearheaded uh, a marvelous marvelous uh, effort uh, called the and <clears throat> the name of it is Vox Populi, which is Latin for the voice of the people. And it is precisely this concept of the sense of the faithful, the sensum fidelium. And the sense of the faithful uh, at this time in history are calling for Mary and her role as co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate to be dogmatically defined by the Pope. And uh, Dr. Miravalli has received literally millions, millions of signatures um, in favor of this, the proclamation of this. Uh, well, this is, Mary, Mary has been uh, officially declared co-redemptrix, mediatrix, and advocate in numerous, uh, in numerous church official magisterial documents. Um, so, within the uh, ordinary magisterium, it is already 
a, a doctrine that Mary is indeed uh, co-redemptrix with Christ. And again, that co in front of redemptrix um, does not mean equal to. It means with. It just simply means with. That Mary, every single one of us is called to be a co-redeemer with Christ. Uh, as St. As Paul expresses uh, that he rejoices in his sufferings. Uh, I rejoice in my sufferings um, that in suffering, uh, he knows, St. Paul knew and understood that he was participating in the sufferings of Christ. And, and when he, the term he used was making up for what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ for the sake of his body, his mystical body, the church. Uh, hello, yes, is anyone present? Oh, I heard, I heard that tone. I wasn't sure if uh, someone came on. But anyway, I wanted to uh, make sure I greeted uh, whoever could have uh, come on or whoever could have called in. Um, but yes, so we had the, uh, the situation where um, uh, many... Uh, um, Oh, Dr. Mark Maravalli was um, spearheaded the Vox Populi movement, where many, 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 uh, uh, many persons were encouraged to, uh, if they if they felt moved to 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 contact the Holy See, and and ultimately the the Vox Populi movement, uh, they were the ones to uh, Mark Maravalli and and the persons that he uh, employed. Uh, were the ones who collected the petitions, and as I mentioned earlier, they had several million, several million petitions um, requesting that uh, John Paul II declare Mary to be the co-redemptrix with Christ. Um, and again, that co is is with, um, but not equal to. And uh, we we know that there is one, uh, there is one redeemer and that is Jesus Christ. And there is one mediator between the Father and humanity, and that is Jesus Christ. And that's the absolute truth. However, just as we have a mediator with God the Father in Jesus Christ, so too do we have a mediator with Christ. And that, mediate, and that mediator is a, is a female, first of all, and so that makes her a mediatrix. Uh, that's where we get the... the, the, the uh, uh, the suffix uh, mediatrix, and we we say that Mary is our mediator with the mediator, our mediatrix with the mediator, Jesus. So Mary is the neck, if you will, of the mystical body. Christ is the head. We are the members. Mary is the neck, and that is precisely why Our Lady, in giving the miraculous medal, which really, as Dr. Mark Miravalli uh, explains is really a mini, a mini Marian catechism. If you look at the Miraculous Medal, you will see depicted on that medal virtually every, every essential dogma concerning Our Lady um, in the Miraculous Medal. We'll discuss that after we finish up with the assumption. But wearing it specifically around the neck, Mary asks that we wear it around the neck. Why? Because... Mary herself is the neck of the mystical body, and that little medal is, is uh, such a powerful, powerful medal. Originally, it was referred to and came out as the Medal of the Immaculate Conception, and it only served to reinforce uh, the truth uh, that at that time had, uh, it was the era of the proclamation of the, of the Immaculate Conception. But so many miracles were associated with the wearing and the use of that medal that it took on the name Miraculous by the very people who, who used it. Because so many miracles were attributed to its use as a sacramental. But to go back to the assumption, um, uh, and just to finish off the Vox Populi uh, and to explain very clearly and, and definitively. Uh, so we have the, the truth that uh, 
just as um, there were numerous petitions for the for the dogmatic declaration of Mary's assumption after the after the uh, declaration of uh, uh, Mary's immaculate conception, so too have there been millions of petitions for the declaration, the ex cathedra definition uh, of the of the doctrine which is already a part of of the uh, it is already a doctrine of the church it is already contained uh, in in the sacred tradition of the church and is already um, regarded as definitive doctrine mary is co-redemptrix with christ um, that is to say she participated in a wholly unique manner with christ uh, granted, it was with, but not in any way, shape, or form equal to. So the co means with, not equal to. And um, just as St. Paul says, I, I rejoice in my sufferings. For uh, I, I make up for what is lacking in, in the mystical body for the sake of... Make up for, for what is lacking uh, in the sufferings of Christ for the sake of his body, the church. And if St. Paul can say that of his own sufferings, certainly the Blessed Virgin Mary can say that of the suffering that she endured watching her son die, the cruel, horrific death that he did die on the cross, knowing him to be not only her son, but the, the only begotten Son of God, um, knowing the love that he had for humanity, knowing the, that he was the most innocent man to ever walk the face of the earth, that he was the holiest human being ever to walk the face of the earth, that he was God himself, knowing that her son and her God was being crucified, that the author of life was being put to death, we can't even begin to grasp or fathom the sufferings that Our Lady experienced at the foot of the cross. Um, Lumen Gentium in, chapter, in, its, in its last chapter, chapter 8, does speak on Our Lady's um, unique, wholly unique participation in the sufferings of her son and how she offered her maternal rights in union with her son's perfect offering and suffered more and merited, merited, she merited more grace for the human family than all other saints combined. Uh, no one, no single person, and, and, and not even all the saints put together merited as much grace for the human family as Our Lady did. Uh, and that just, that gives us just a glimpse of the tremendous suffering that she endured. And it was a suffering that literally would have killed her were it not for a special grace given to her by God to essentially keep her alive, to enable her to endure the, the sorrow, the pain, the agony that she co-endured with her son, uh, again, the co being with, not equal to. Mary is co-redemptrix. Mary is mediatrix, which means that every single grace that comes to us from God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, merited by Jesus Christ on the cross, um, it, Christ is the, you know, our, the Father is the creator, Jesus is the redeemer, um, the Holy Spirit is the sanctifier. And Mary cooperates with each person of the Most Holy Trinity. She cooperates with the Father, with the Son, her Son, and with the Holy Spirit. Um, so we see in the co-redemption, in the work of co-redemption, she's cooperating with Christ, her Son. In the work of mediation, the distribution of the... It's only appropriate that she would participate in mediating the grace uh, dispensing the graces that she participated with Christ in meriting on the cross and that she would participate in the distribution of those graces 
that she played a role in obtaining for the human family with her son in a wholly unique and singular fashion. Um, so Mary really, the, the whole concept of Mary as spiritual mother is embedded within these truths. These are the truths that serve as the theological foundation for Mary as spiritual mother of the human family. And this last, this would be the fifth and final Marian dogma. And it would be absolutely unique uh, and, 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 and different from all of the other, uh, certainly the, the logical consequence of all of the other Marian dogmas. Um, and it would be the crowning Marian dogma. And it would be wholly unique in the sense that it would be the first and only Marian dogma that pertain to Mary's relationship with humanity as opposed to a special prerogative that she, well, of course, we are certainly stating that she is the co-redemptrix, the mediatrix, and the advocate, but we're stating that each of those functions as co-redemptrix, as co-redemptrix mediatrix, and advocate, these are for the sake of serving as the spiritual mother of humanity. So this, this dogma would specifically have to do with Mary's relationship with humanity, which is entirely unique to that dogma, unlike any other dogma. Um, so that's a, a fascinating thing. And uh, Dr. Mark Miravelli has garnered, like I said, millions upon millions of, of uh, petitions. Uh, unfortunately, we, we really felt uh, that John Paul would, would have been the Pope to declare this uh, marvelous dogma, being the, the Marian Pope that he was, uh, having taken, uh, having taken uh, Louis de Munford's um, uh, model of, uh, motto uh, for, for total consecration, totus tuus, uh, and that is a, an abbreviated form of the of the daily renewal, the, the Latin text of the daily renewal of one's consecration, which is totus tuus ego sum, ego, totus tuus ego sum et omnia mea tua sunt. Uh, I am all yours, Mary, and all I have is yours. Uh, totus tuus ego sum et omnia mea tua sunt. Um, I am all yours, and all I have is yours. And um, so it would have been really appropriate for, uh, for John Paul, but the thing is, we as the laity do not see what's going on in the Vatican, and I think there is, uh, and it's, it's fairly evident at this point, there, is, uh, there are tremendous um, pressures that uh, various factions in, in, the, um, in the hierarchy uh, can, can there's, a lot, there's a lot more going on, and um, it can be hard to understand that, given the nature of of what 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 it is the the divine nature of of the the church. Um, and um, but I I often remind myself that the while while the church, like Christ, is both human and divine. Um, Unlike Christ, it is not spotless in its humanity. <laughs> so that's, the, uh, that's one of the things that we ought to keep in mind. We have uh, a church that is both human and divine, like, uh, like its head. Uh, Christ is both human and divine. But unlike its head, who is both human and divine, uh, it is not spotless in its humanity. We, we still suffer the consequences of or the the effects of original sin, and we must contend with those. And so ours, the, the human nature uh, of the church is, is a fallen human nature, and we must contend with that reality. But um, that does not pertain to the church's teaching, nor does it pertain to the church's sacraments. The church is spotless in her teaching and in her sacraments. Unfortunately, she is not spotless in her members, but um, 
That's just the way it is, and hopefully... But we look forward to the end of time when, from an eschatological perspective, the church will be utterly purified and will undergo a radical purification. And if you, if you were to ask me, I would say that we are witnessing the... We've been witnessing and living through the, the beginning of the, the great purification and tribulation spoken of in sacred scripture in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, chapter 24, um, Revelation, the book of Revelation, um, the book of Daniel, um, and the many, uh, the many uh, prophecies in sacred scripture having to do with the end times. So, um, let's turn now to the assumption as it is found in sacred scripture. And of course, again here, we're dealing with the seeds um, of this doctrine, this dogma, rather. A seed of the doctrine of Mary's assumption, and again I am reading from Introduction to Mary, The Heart of Marian Doctrine and Devotion, um, by Dr. Miravalli. A seed of the doctrine of Mary's assumption is found in sacred scripture in Genesis 3.15, the proto, what we call the proto-evangelium, the first gospel, the first promise um, that the first, the first promise by God that he would send a redeemer, that he would correct the situation of the fool. Uh, a papal document, a, a, as, I'm sorry, as the papal document of Pius XII explains, Genesis 3.15 foreshadows Mary as intimately sharing in the same absolute victory of her son over Satan. Quote, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. Genesis 3.15. According to St. Paul, and this is cited from Romans 5-8 through and Hebrews 2, the consequences of Satan's seed, evil, are twofold, sin and death, or bodily corruption. So, sin and death. Um, therefore, Mary, who shared in her son's victory over Satan and his seed, would have to be saved from both sin and death or corruption. Mary did triumph over sin in her immaculate conception, and triumphed over death, specifically the corruption of the body, in her glorious assumption at the end of her earthly life. It is worthy of note that many bishops from around the world sent to Pius XII the same scriptural support from Genesis 3.15 for Mary's assumption. So there had been some general Episcopal co confirmation that Genesis 3.15, the Proto-Evangelium, is the primary doctrinal seed in sacred scripture for Mary's assumption. Other scriptural support for the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary includes uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verse 28, since her bodily assumption is a natural effect of being, quote, quote, unquote, full of grace. Revelation, chapter 12, verse 1, where Mary's coronation implies her preceding bodily assumption 1 Corinthians 15, 23, and Matthew chapter 27, verses 52 through 53, which support the possibility of a bodily assumption when we read, quote, Arise, O Lord, into your resting place, you and the ark which you have sanctified. And that is taken from Psalm 131, verse 8. So we have a, a, a number of different passages, but really it is principally uh, Genesis 3.15. And now let's turn to the assumption in sacred tradition. The doctrine of Mary's assumption is also found in sacred tradition. The early Christians gradually unraveled the implicitly revealed reference to Mary's assumption. Our first explicit reference is by St. Gregory of Tours, who died in 593. And he states, quote, the Lord commanded the holy body of Mary to be born on a cloud to paradise, where, reunited to its soul and exalting with the elect, it enjoys the everlasting bliss of eternity. End of quote. From the 7th century onwards, numerous church fathers proclaimed the doctrine of the Assumption, such as St. Germain of Constantinople, 
who died in 733, St. Andrew of Crete, who died in 740, and St. John Damascene, who died in 749. Uh, these are just three examples. During the 6th century, the first liturgical feasts dedicated to the Assumption appear in Syria and in the Alexandrian Church in Egypt. Western liturgical feasts dedicated to Mary's Assumption take place in Gaul, which is modern-day France, in the 7th century, and by the 8th century, it was celebrated in Rome. From the 13th century onward, the doctrine of Mary's Assumption was taught with near unanimity by church writers and theologians in both the East and West, or as Pope St. John, Pope John, Pope John Paul the Great referred to the East and the West as the two lungs. Uh, we, the church can finally breathe with her two lungs uh, if, she, if she is brought together and if the, the schism of the, uh, the West breaking from the, or the East breaking from the West uh, were to be uh, rectified. Um, that was the, one of the first, the first major schisms in the history of the church. Um, the, uh, the, the break of the church, uh, the break of the Eastern Orthodox Church from, from Rome. Um, relationship to other Marian doctrines. Pius the Tw- and again, a, a continuing to read from Introduction to Mary by Dr. Merval. Relation to other Marian doctrines. Pius XII makes a major point for the validity of Mary's assumption as a definable doctrine by drawing an essential connection between the assumption and other Marian defined doctrines, in particular, the motherhood of God and the Immaculate Conception. As for the connection between the assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary and her motherhood of God, Pope Pius XII states that it is fitting Jesus would honor his mother as only a divine son could. No one obeys the fourth commandment of honoring I'm sorry. No one obeys the fourth commandment of honoring father and mother better than Jesus, who is the son of the father and son of Mary. It is thereby reasonable that Jesus would uniquely honor his mother, first, by preserving her from the corruption of the grave, and secondly, by granting her a glorification of the body in heaven before the general resurrection of the body for all other saints on the last day. Even more evident is the assumption in its essential connection to Mary's immaculate conception. Simply put, Mary's assumption is the natural effect of her immaculate conception. The assumption is the logical effect of being preserved from original sin, since corruption of the body is an effect of original sin. And this is cited from Romans uh, chapters 5 through 8 and Hebrews 2. Had Adam and Eve not sinned, they too, at the end of their earthly life, could have been assumed into heaven without the corruption of their bodies. Corruption of the body is a result of original sin. Uh, Therefore, since Mary was preserved from original sin in her immaculate conception, and since she sustained her fullness of grace given by God, Our Lady could not have experienced the fruit of original sin in the corruption of the body at the end of her earthly life. The doctrines of the Immaculate Conception and the Assumption are interiorly and logically connected, as Pius XII explains in the papal document. And I am about to quote, Dr. Maravalli quotes from Munificentissimus Deus, uh, numbers four and five. Quote, These two privileges, i.e. the Assumption and the Immaculate Conception, are most closely bound to one another. Indeed, Christ overcame sin and death by his own death. And the man who, through baptism, is supernaturally regenerated, has conquered sin and death through the same Christ. However, as a general rule, God does not wish to grant to the just the full effect of their victory over death until the end of time shall have come. And so it is that the bodies of even the just are corrupted after death, and that only on the last day will they be joined, each to his own glorified soul. Nevertheless, God has willed that the Blessed Virgin Mary should be exempted from this general law. 
by an entirely unique privilege, she completely overcame sin through her immaculate conception and therefore was not subject to the law of remaining in the corruption of the grave, nor did she have to wait until the end of time for the redemption of her body. Munificentissimus Deus, Numbers 4 and 5. And this now, this is me speaking, uh, Jason Bruno. I couldn't help but to think when I first read through this of the preservation of certain saints' um, bodies. Um, you might call them super saints, <laughs> for lack of a better expression. Um, but there are certain saints who, during the process of the transferal of the bodily remains of, of a saint from, say, one grave site to uh, a new grave site, or, or what have you, or to, to more adequately uh, acknowledge the, if, if, a, if, a, if an individual is, has undergone the, the process of beatification and canonization and is raised to the honors of the altar, um, it is quite possible that the church might move the mortal remains of the body of the saint uh, in order to place it in a more dignified uh, grave site or setting where it can be honored uh, by the public, by the faithful. Um, and in the process of, of um, interring the body, or, 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 or I should say mo moving, um, the, there, there have been numerous instances where the bodies of certain saints have been found to be wholly incorrupt. Um, such is the case with Padre Pio, such is the case with St. Bernadette of Subaru, um, so too with uh, St. John Vianney. Um, this is also the case with St. Catherine Labore. Um, and numerous, numerous saints uh, who were known for their deep holiness. Um, it, it, now, this is an entirely miraculous phenomenon. We're not talking about... They, they, these, these, these bodies never underwent any type of embalming. Uh, Present-day embalming didn't even begin. Uh, and it didn't even exist uh, in, in, the, in the case of the majority of these saints whose bodies are wholly, at least, or at least in part, uh, incorrupt. And it, it, does, it, it, it may vary from saint to saint, but for the most part, there are certain saints whose bodies are completely intact. And if you'd like to see this with your own eyes, um, I would encourage you to go onto YouTube and to type in the search bar in, in, on YouTube, um, incorruptible saints or preservation of the bodies of saints, and you will find videos, uh, compilation videos of persons who have put together either images of, um, because w when this happens, it is quite often the case that the, the, saint, the saint will be placed in a glass uh, uh, coffin, uh, under, uh, usually under an altar, so that the body can be observed and can be seen and viewed and venerated uh, by the faithful. And it is usually... Uh, sometimes it is the, it's in the main chapel, uh, other times it's in the side chapel. But these incorruptibles, these saints whose bodies have been entirely preserved uh, for hundreds and hundreds of years after their death, with no special um, treatment of the body, to no special uh, preservation processes were engaged in to to facilitate this, um, not even from a purely natural vantage point. And there are cases where certain bodily re remains of certain human persons or, or animals have been uh, preserved through, like, through such examples of ice. Ice is a natural preservative, uh, and there have been the bodies of, of very, very old human beings uh, preserved in ice for many thousands of years. 
But this is not the case, and this is not what we're speaking of. We're speaking of a, an entirely miraculous phenomenon whereby, whereby the body of the saint is wholly incorrupt. And I think that, it, it, to me, it's, 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 I would say that the, the, the corruption of the body that is the natural consequence of, or is the consequence of, of, of sin. Um, the, the, I think with, in, the, in, in the situation with these incorruptible saints who have somehow avoided cor- bodily corruption, it seems to me, and uh, this, is, this is not a, a definitive, this is simply my conjecture and, and opinion, but it would just seem to me th- that we have our Lord granting this grace uh, as almost as if to testify to the to the to the sanctity that this person did in fact attain throughout his or her lifetime, and the fact that the body is preserved is a testament to the holiness of the the the, 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 the radical heroic charity <clears throat> that they that they attained in life and when you think about the fact that you know many of these saints were religious uh, who lived um, they lived religious lives they 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 lived the life of a, of a, a religious man or woman uh, either a priest or a brother or a, or a, or a consecrated virgin or a nun um, and they would receive our Lord on a daily basis, and if you just think think of that 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 reality of receiving the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ every single day of your life, and having this real, true, authentic union with the living God each and every day of your life and then maintaining that relationship through prayer and through the works of charity that are the logical consequence that should flow from the Eucharist. The Eucharist is the source from which we derive all of our apostolic impetus and it is the summit toward which everything we do as Christians is oriented. The teleological goal of the Christian life is ultimately participation in the heavenly wedding banquet of the bridegroom and his bride, of Christ and his church. And that is anticipated in each celebration of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, where we are literally fed with his body and blood. And when you think in those terms, it's not that far-fetched to find saints whose bodies are holy and corrupt. The sanctification is so radical that it actually preserves the body which makes all the sense in the world because Christ incarnated himself. He uh, he himself, the divine person of our Lord Jesus Christ, assumed a true human nature. And like I always say, he, he sanctified everything human especially the human body, which, and, we, and of course, it's a, it is a, an, a, an essential doctrine, an essential axiom, an essential teaching of our faith contained in the creed itself that we believe in the resurrection of the body. So this is this bodily assumption that Our Lady already has this, this, number one, the, the preservation from bodily corruption, the corruption that, that 
ought to come with the death of a human body. And secondly, um, Mary being given a glorious body in heaven, the fact that her body was taken up into heaven and glorified, that is something we will eventually, all of us, every single one of us who, granted we make it into heaven, granted we are um, fortunate enough to receive the graces necessary to be saved, which is the whole goal and purpose of, of, of life on earth, to make it to heaven, um, that we too will participate in this bodily um, this this restoration of our bodies, uh, the glorification, uh, is, we will all one day participate in the glorification of our bodies. We will have glorified bodies. Our bodies will be given back to us, but in a glorified manner. Um, uh, they will be the same bodies. Uh, it, it will be the same body, but it will be a glorified body. So that brings us to the end of these, and I just wanted to state that um, uh, with regard to our Blessed Lady. Um, or complete that, um, okay, going back to that uh, passage in the uh, table document, uh, Munificentissimus Deus, Numbers four and five. These two privileges, the Assumption and the Immaculate Conception, are most closely bound to one another. Indeed, Christ overcame sin and death by his own death, and the man who, through baptism, is supernaturally regenerated has conquered sin and death through the same Christ. However, as a general rule, God does not wish to grant to the just the full effect of their victory over death until the end of time shall have come. And so it is, the bodies of even the just are corrupted after death, and that only on the last day will they be joined, each to his own glorified soul. Nevertheless, God has willed that the Blessed Virgin Mary should be exempted from this general law. By an entirely unique privilege, she completely overcame sin through her immaculate conception, and therefore was not subject to that law of remaining in the corruption of the grave, nor did she have to wait until the end of time for the redemption of her body. The question, so that finishes uh, uh, our coverage of the, uh, the assumption. However, the question of Mary having died is a completely separate question, and the church has never come to a consensus on this. Um, and as Dr. Mirabelli writes, the question may then be asked, did Mary die? Human death may be defined as a separation of soul and body at the end of earthly life. The church has never defined whether or not at the end of Mary's earthly life she experienced some temporary separation of soul and body before her assumption into heaven. Such a temporary separation of soul and body as long as it did not include any material corruption of the body, the effect of sin, could have been experienced by the mother of Jesus. Pius XII intentionally, purposely avoided any direct statement regarding Mary's death by using the moral general expression, quote, at the end of her earthly life, unquote. The majority of theologians hold that Mary did experience some type of temporary death so as to enter heaven in the manner which most closely resembled that of her son. What is certain is that Mary could not experience the corruption of the body, the, quote, material death, unquote, that comes as a result of original sin. The words of Vatican II well attest to the unique event of Mary's glorious assumption as a proper earthly end to the one who, in all her doctrines, reflects a person of perfect obedience to God's will and of intimate and singular union with her Son, our Lord. And we read in Lumen Gentium number 59, quote, Finally, the Immaculate Virgin, preserved from all stain of original sin, was taken up body and soul into heavenly glory. When her earthly life was over, and exalted by the Lord as queen over all things, that she might be the more fully conformed to her Son, 
the Lord of Lords, cited from Revelation chapter 19, verse 16, and conqueror of sin and death, Lumen Gentium number 59. These four central doctrines of the Blessed Virgin, her divine maternity, immaculate conception, perpetual virginity, and her bodily assumption, reveal the unique role of the Virgin of Nazareth in God's perfect plan of salvation. We will see a profound complementarity and convergence of these doctrines and their concurring Marian privileges as we examine Mary's fifth doctrinal role as spiritual mother of Christ's faithful and as co-redemptrix, mediatrix of all graces, and advocate for the human family. Surely, in light of the sublime graces and privileges poured upon the Virgin and manifested in these doctrines, there was more than ample reason for the Marian self-prophecy that, quote, all generations will call me blessed, unquote. Luke chapter 1, verse 48. And that concludes our show this evening, our coverage of Mary and her bodily assumption. I am Jason Brunel, um, and this has been another episode of The Glories of Mary. May the Lord bless us, protect us from all evil, and bring us to life everlasting. Amen. Good night. We hope you enjoyed the program, and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.